So th thanks very much, Mark, and, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, please accept my humblest apologies for being late. I really thought it was at 6.30, and I would happily have left you sitting here until 6.30 uh, <laughs> while I was busy at the legislatures. <laughs> so um, I really do apologize, and I will uh, pay more attention to, as Paul suggested, reading my emails more carefully. Um, so yes, I used to be a prosecutor. I was a prosecutor for 26 years. And, uh, and then after a rather public spat with my employer, I went to parliament. Um, not to be a politician, I must um, stress that from the outset. I am not, I suppose I am, but I do not regard myself a particularly successful politician. Um, I do, however, think that a lot can be done from parliament. Uh, on the platform that Parliament gives you to help a lot of people in South Africa, uh, and that certainly is um, what I set out to do. And Parliament is a uh, is a great platform for doing that. So, uh, and and I have I must also add no uh, no fight with the National Prosecuting Authority. Um, I uh, spent the better part of half my life there. Uh, I loved it, and uh, and the NPA is an institution that is both essential and one that I would like very much to see succeed. Uh, I certainly have uh, for ribbles with uh, some of the people at the NPA, but not with the NPA itself. Uh, so, Mark asked me to talk a little bit about the, the state of the NPA, and obviously uh, that goes hand in hand with the criminal justice system. Um, asked me to talk a little bit about the JSC, and then um, the thing that I know least about, he asked me to talk about, is the electoral reform. Um, so I'll leave that for last, and hopefully you'll all be tired and, <laughs> <laughs> and sort of gloss over it. <laughs> so, so the National Prosecuting Authority, as you know, is the only prosecuting authority in South Africa. It is. Uh, a creature of statute, and it is the only prosecuting authority in South Africa in terms of the constitution at the moment. Uh, and it takes care of uh, a wide range of issues, criminal prosecutions largely, but uh, one or two other two, one or two other things that are possibly not uh, seen as criminal prosecutions. But it performs an essential function in our society, and uh, it's an institution that uh, we should have regard for uh, and should support. And uh, this afternoon we have, lucky enough to have, the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, Nicolette Bell, with us. She's just been appointed, so congratulations, Nicolette. Uh, she's been acting for years. I don't know why it took them so long to appoint her. She's good enough to act for 25 years. She's good enough to do the job. Um, and, and yes, the, the NPA is, uh, is an institution that is in serious trouble. And feel free at any time, Nicolette, to and the ladies to, to disagree with me. <laughs> um, the NPI is an institution that is in very serious trouble and should worry us all deeply, deeply. Um, the NPI is hollowed out. It was one of the institutions that was uh, most seriously targeted, along with the police and SARS, uh, 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 by the state capture uh, little gang, um, to hollow out any prosecutorial or investigation capabilities. Uh, of course, for the own benefit of their own ends. Um, and we're seeing them reaping the benefits of it now. Uh, I see Marcus here still walking up and down the promenade uh, every single day as if it belongs to him. Uh, a prosecution, hmm, not so much. Uh, we see Jacob Zuma playing what everybody thinks is playing the fool with the courts. Uh, it's, very difficult, you know, when, when, when you're a prosecutor, it's very difficult to combat those kind of tactics. Uh, we all believe in the rule of law, and please believe me, please believe in the rule of law. And if anybody asks you what the rule of law is, the rule of law is quite simple. It's how you treat the people you don't like. Uh, uh, it's, it's really how you treat the people you don't like. It's easy to treat the people you do like well. The rule of law is how you treat the people you don't, how fairly you can treat the people you don't like. And one day, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, one day you'll be very glad that there is a thing called the rule of law because you may need it. Uh, so the NPA is an institution that is bound by the constitution uh, and bound by the rule of law. And so they operate within those parameters and the people that they go after don't. Makes it very, very difficult. They're completely hollowed out. Um, and forgive me, ladies, but you know, I can probably count on my two hands and my two feet uh, with my fingers and my toes, the number of 
really experienced and confident and specialized prosecutors in the NPA, in the entire country, who can do the kinds of cases that state capture is going to deliver. The kinds of cases that are going to come from Zonda, and I think I'm being generous uh, with using my toes as well. Uh, but for the purpose of today's discussion, let's say I'll use my toes as well. Um, it's probably a lot less than that. It takes, in my view, 20, 10 years to make a good prosecutor, an experienced prosecutor. It takes 20 to make a good specialized prosecutor. Prosecuting is not something you learn at university. Lucas, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but the criminal law is not something that you learn at university. You only learn what it is. You don't learn how to do it. And it takes many years of prosecuting to learn how to do it, to make mistakes, learn from your mistakes, hopefully not repeat them, and, uh, and, and of being in court. Being in court is what makes a prosecutor. You go to court, you make mistakes, you learn, you gain confidence, you, you, you litigate against people who are much more experienced than yourself, and it takes a lot of time to develop the ability and the confidence and the experience to deal with those types of cases. And cases are no longer easy. It's not, uh, it's not um, housebreaking, shoplifting, and those types of things. Uh, complex commercial cases, corruption, money laundering, very, very complex matters. You deal with vast amounts of different kind of evidence. You deal with uh, a huge amounts of documentary evidence, which is really intimidating for any prosecutor. Uh, you have to deal with uh, cyber forensic evidence, which is a whole new field for everybody. And none of us are kids, so if, you were, if we were all 12, we could probably do it quite easily. Uh, but none of us are 12, and so it's not quite so easy. Uh, and it takes a lot of reading, a lot of studying, a lot of trying to keep up with new developments. Uh, and and the, police, the, the National Prosecuting Authority is nothing, absolutely nothing, without the South African police. So you can have a National Prosecuting Authority staffed with thousands of the best prosecutors in the world. And with our police force, they would be completely hamstrung and quite useless because the prosecutors can only prosecute that which the police bring them. Prosecutors are not investigators. It's not their job. It's not their mandate. And they can't do it. And so the police is equally hollowed out. And so while we have on my fingers and toes less than 20 prosecutors in my view who can deal with these matters, believe me, on my hands I will have fingers over if I count the police who can investigate it. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, that is a big problem. It places a much bigger burden on the prosecutors because now they have to hold the hand of the policeman, tell him what to do, show him how to do it. They start crossing the line of, of where the mandate starts and stops and it creates all kinds of problems for them and possibly also in court. And so uh, while I'm very vocally critical of the NPA for not having prosecuted any big corruption cases uh, in the last 10 years, uh, that doesn't mean that it's just because they're too lazy to do so. Uh, they're, they're, they're huge problems, they're big problems that they have to overcome. And, and, and I do think that um, that they're a little bit slow off the mark, and that one, maybe two cases could have been uh, at least in court by now. Um, certainly some of the state capture cases, in my view, are, are ready for prosecution and didn't require uh, that much extra work. Uh, the investigative journalists to whom we owe a huge debt in this country uh, produced a lot of the, the work already done, documents obtained, uh, money trials followed. So uh, there was a lot of work done already, um, and I think that the NPA could have piggybacked on that uh, more efficiently than they have done. Uh, but, but Zonda is going to produce huge amounts of work for the NPA, massive amounts of huge, long, uh, difficult and complex cases to prosecute. And, and frankly, I don't know that the NPA, even if it was perfectly staffed and um, fully resourced, I just don't know that there's going to be time to do it. Uh, if, we, if we have a look at what Jacob Zuma is doing with his, with his arms deal case, um, there's nothing that can prevent other accused from doing that. Uh, and the best prosecutor in the world can't stop the accused using those tactics. And so it will take time. And therefore, I fear that 
that they won't get to all of the, the cases that have been the result of, of Zonda. And, and uh, please, I mean, don't forget the state capture is not the only thing on the menu. Uh, people are not, um, haven't stopped committing crime um, in the last uh, 10 years. The, there's the usual amount of crime happening in South Africa, and it is complex and, and, uh, and serious, and it needs attention. And, and everyday cases also need attention. People are being murdered and raped and having things stolen every single day, and those matters can't be just pushed aside so that the prosecutors can concentrate on, on state capture and, and big fraud. Um, everybody's case is as important to them as the next guy. And so they kept busy, and, and, and we've just come back from a lot of oversight. Uh, the courts are kept busy with those everyday matters that are very important, because that's what makes the criminal justice system tick. That is, that is the job of somebody like Nicolette and of the lady sitting here. It's that job that you help people every single day get their matter attended to. Um, the other stuff comes on top of that, which makes it even more difficult. Uh, so. So I just, I, I don't know how they're going to get to it, and, and I, have, I have a solution. I, I know it's not a, a popular solution, probably very unpopular with the National Prosecuting Authority. Uh, but our, our solution is simply that, uh, that we need another body to deal with these big corruption matters. Constitution, only one NPA. Yes, yes. That's where I started. So what we would need for that is a constitutional amendment, uh, which can be done. The constitution has been amended, I think, 17 or 18 times already in the last few years. And, uh, and there's nothing preventing another amendment. Uh, and we're suggesting a Chapter 9 institution that would, uh, that would run along the lines of the National Prosecuting Authority. And in consultation and conjunction with the National Prosecuting Authority, because I personally hold the view that you, South Africa is not big enough for two law enforcement bodies like the NPA. And so it would have to be an independent institution that dealt with serious corruption and take that off the hands of the National Prosecuting Authority in order to free their hands to do all the other things that they're required to do, but not not in competition with them. Uh, to find a way to have it done in consultation with them and in conjunction with them. Uh, so that, so that uh, it, burden, it lightens their burden, but deals with the massive corruption that's taking place and allows us to, to, fa to, to actually finalize these matters in a foreseeable space of time uh, before we all pass on from old age. And, and try and get that money back that was stolen and it's quantified now, I think at around 57 trillion or something. It's a <laughs> massive amount of money. We probably won't get it all, but it'd be nice to get some of it. Uh, we sh surely need it. And, uh, and so that is, that is our, uh, our proposal for a solution to the problem. And, uh, and I do get that it's not going to be widely. I'll take questions at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to ask, how does this differ from the ID? Uh, your differs, solution, how does it differ from the ID? I'll answer your question at the end. So, um, so we, we punt that as a, as a solution. Um, it would be an independent body. It would um, be separate from the National Prosecuting Authority. It would be uh, separate from all the other bodies. It would have its own investigative capacity and its own in-house capacity to deal with uh, all the skills and resource scarcities that plague the current criminal justice institutions. Uh, it would take the place of the, uh, of the, the Directorate for Special Operations, so the Scorpions, which was disbanded uh, by Parliament after the Travelgate scandal. When, uh, when the uh, MPs were caught uh, stealing uh, on their travel allowance, disgracefully so. Um, most of them are still in Parliament, disgracefully so, and, uh, and never were tried nor spent one second in jail. Um, but they did disband the DSA because they didn't like the fact that it had the ability to go after them. So it's colloquially known as the, the Scorpions. Um, it was then litigated by uh, a fellow called Glenister, and uh, Paul Hoffman 
uh, acted on his behalf and a lot of litigation ensued and the courts have laid down uh, pretty clear directions of what such an investigative body should look like uh, and how you should insulate it against future uh, attacks from the legislator like, like took place with the Scorpions. It will differ from the investigative directorate in, the, in this sense that the ID has a, at the moment, has a, a very short lifespan and is due to uh, die in around two years, maybe less. Um, it is not separate from the, uh, the difficulties faced by, by any of the other criminal justice institutions in that it derives its budget from the Department of Justice and, uh, and is reliant upon them for, for their budget. Um, and, and really what they have been getting is, is peanuts. Um, you know, it sounds like a lot of money, 13 million here, 60 million there. Um, it's, I suppose that it is a lot of money. But in the general scheme of things, if you think what they have to do with it, it's nothing. It's, if, you, if you're hiring the skills of a forensic accountant mm -hmm. to do one case, and they, 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 if, 10 years ago when I stopped prosecuting, uh, the quotes for, for Tannenbaum's uh, forensic audit was 26 million for one case. Uh, they have many hundreds of cases. They're, just, they're under, completely under-resourced, they've got no chance. Uh, and so, so in my view, uh, uh, any, inst any body that they institute that would remain under the wing of the NPA and under the roof of the uh, Department of Justice is, is, for that reason, doomed to failure. They don't have the required independence. They don't have the required independence with regards to their budget. And they don't have the ability to resource themselves uh, adequately. The NPA is now looking at, at, uh, at donor funding. It's not a new concept at all, but it's causing an outcry. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, oh, they'll lose the independence, they'll be dictated to. Well, what utter nonsense. Uh, no good prosecutor allows themselves to be dictated to by anybody. Uh, and, and anybody who gives money with strings attached should rather keep their money. And I'm quite sure that the NPA will take no money from anybody who has conditions attached. So no quid pro quo, no favors asked, none granted. You give your money and then, and then you have no further say about what happens to it or don't give it. That's just how it works. Uh, but, the, but an independent Chapter 9 institution would uh, be built to, to deal with, with those issues so that it could, in fact, uh, be funded um, both from government and from private funding, without having um, those difficulties that now beset the issue of, of private funding and the NPA. And, and I must again stress that it will never be intended to be in competition with the NPA or, or, uh, or, or operating in a, in, a, in a way that isn't able to work in confluence with the NPA. Um, it's merely intended as a method, a means, a body that has the required independence to, uh, to help the NPA with its burden in the criminal, law, in the criminal justice uh, system and to ensure that South Africans see justice, uh, as I said before, we all die of old age. So um, that being the, the National Prosecuting Authority currently, uh, uh, you know, they have a, a new national director. Uh, I don't think that she had any idea. Uh, I think she tried very hard to inform herself, but I don't think she had any idea uh, of what she was uh, getting herself into. Uh, I don't think that she could have formed any concept of how uh, the NPA in the 10 years that she was away had deteriorated. And, and I don't think, even now, she probably doesn't have a full understanding of how many people there are in her own organization who desperately want to see her fail yes. uh, and who work every single day to undermine all the good work that she's doing and she is doing good work, make no mistake. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very big job, you can't do it on your own. You have to be able to delegate. Uh, for that reason she has uh, some deputy national directors and then really the prosecuting work is done by 
the National Prosecuting Service, of which Rodney de Kock uh, is the actual de facto head, and then people like uh, Nicolette and the other DPPs who run the day-to-day -day running of the courts in their, in their provinces. And, uh, and so while all those people are doing a great job, um, they're doing it with uh, their hands tied behind their back, in my view, and, and Shamila is, um, is climbing a hill that runs like that. <laughs> Uh, because I think for every step that she takes forward, there are people in her organization who drag her, drag her back two steps. Uh, and so um, it's going to take her a very, very long time to achieve what she, and what she wants to achieve is wonderful. I'm pleased that she achieves it. Uh, but, but it's going to take her a very long time to achieve it until she can get rid of those people uh, who are undermining her. And I think we all know who they are. Uh, I don't think there's any difficulty in knowing who they are. And my advice to her would be fire them and let them litigate. Appoint somebody to deal with the litigation. And it doesn't matter what it costs you, it's cheap at the price. And get on with the rest of, of your life. Uh, carry on working. So uh, those, are, those are my views on the NPA. I think they're, they're trying very hard and sometimes they're just very trying. Um, but, uh, but I do think that they're doing the, the best that they can with what they've got, but what they've got really is just not enough. And with the best will in the world, if they all work 24 hours a day for the rest of their lives, they cannot catch up with a kind of deluge of criminality that South Africa is undergoing at the moment. It's just not possible. Uh, it's just not possible. And then, you know, on oversight, we see courts that are, are just so dysfunctional that makes you want to weep. We go to the appellate, the appellate division, we go to the appeal court in Bloemfontein, and the, the president of the appeal court tells us that on a rainy day, she has to organize buckets for the roof because it leaks so much. Now, I mean, they have no lift. The lift shaft is full of water and has been for the past couple of years. Nobody can get a pump and pump it out. I could get a pump and pump it out. Uh, you know, so they're dependent on public works, and I'm sure, I'm sure public works drives every DPP and every national director are quite mad because they produce nothing at all. Uh, and whatever they're supposed to do, they don't do. Um, but if the appellate division is in, they have, a, they have a library that's full of the most beautiful old books, valuable old books, it's not fireproof. Uh, so if they have a fire tomorrow, God forbid, those books are gone. There's a little, little case in the middle where the most valuable manuscripts that the justice has paid for themselves to protect those manuscripts. And it can't be. I went to, uh, I went to the court in, in Woolsey the other day because I uh, have an interest in, in something that's happening there. I must tell you that the court is spotless. Small little court, spotless, spotless, tidy. Every single form is in the right place, beautifully in piles, clean. Everyone's friendly. They follow themselves to help you. Wonderful, wonderful. Tiny little court, so helpful, you can't imagine. Uh, and then I went to Malmesbury, well, not so much. Uh, uh, eventually I pulled rank and then I got what I wanted, but otherwise there was no way I was getting it. Uh, and so I was thinking if, if I was just, you know, a member of the public coming in trying to get access to documents to which I'm perfectly entitled, public documents. I just say, sorry, the court closes at 1 o'clock, you can't come in anymore. You know, where from? Um, so, you know, you have, these, you have these differences. Courts in the Eastern Cape where the prosecutors have no toilets. No toilets, no toilets. Prosecutors have to work for the whole day from 8 o'clock to 4 no toilet. Not one toilet. That function, not one. I mean, it's an absolute disgrace. But they're there, they go to work every single day. Uh, so while we're busy pillaring them for, for you know, not producing uh, top-class work every single day, they're there. No toilets, but they're there every single day. So uh, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, the Department of Justice doesn't have the money. The reason they don't have the money is because it was all stolen. And the reason we can't get it back is because they have no money. So... <laughs> So I, I, don't, I don't see uh, a solution. My, my, only, my only solution really is a, a, a different body to deal with those matters, which I believe are just too much for the NPA to deal with right now. 
Then uh, you also asked me, Mark, to talk about the Judicial Services Commission. Uh, very importantly and correctly, you said that I do not represent the Democratic Alliance on the, on the uh, Judicial Services Commission. It's not a party political body. And uh, we try very hard to remind ourselves of that every time we go there. Some have more success than others. Um, it is a, a body in which we represent Parliament and therefore our constituents. And that's why there are politicians on the Judicial Services Commission, so that we can represent uh, the, 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 the public in, in, in uh, evaluating and choosing names to send to the president to appoint as judges. Uh, and so it's, it's, not a, it's not a party political thing. You don't, uh, you don't pick the judges that you think will be DA friendly. Um, it's, a, it's a serious job, I believe, um, that should be taken very seriously and often isn't. Uh, where I think you know, the, the preparation for the JSC, you don't, uh, there's, there's no extra prize money for being on the JSC, uh, but every time they sit, which is three or four times a year, sometimes more, you get used to be five or six piles of documents like this to read through. Before now, fortunately, we have um, flash drives, and so a little flash drive gets delivered to your house. And they used to deliver that to my office in Cape Town, and then I would have to take it to Pretoria in two very large suitcases. <laughs> so thank God for flash drives, and uh, and there's a lot of work that goes into preparing if you prepare properly for the JSC. A lot of reading, a lot of extra research, and I don't know about other people, but politicians don't have researchers contrary to popular belief, so you have to do your own. And um, and. Uh, and the JSC has not uh, covered itself in glory in the most recent past. Uh, that would uh, be largely due to the behavior of um, one or two politicians, fortunately not all of them, and then one or two silks, fortunately not all of them. And uh, mostly um, those people's terms have uh, come to an end and they have been replaced with new people and uh, and the Chief Justice, of course, has also been uh, came to the end of his term and has been replaced by uh, Chief Justice Zondo, who sat us down right at the very beginning of his term and um, explained what the rules of engagement under his uh, stewardship would be and made that very clear that he was not going to stand for the type of shenanigans that had taken place before, which I think uh, we're all very happy about. Um, set down some serious rules of engagement and um, reminded us of, of, uh, of why we're there. So we're there in terms of uh, our constitutional mandate and took us through that. Uh, the, a variety of protocols that, that uh, have bearing on how the JSC operates and is expected to operate, took us through those. It's quite, uh, quite embarrassing that people of my age needed to be trained on how to do their job, but, but uh, clearly we did need it and, and I think we're all better for it. And, uh, and so hopefully the JSC will um, produce better performances going forward for um, the Deputy Chief Justice post uh, early in June. Um, so I think that it will be quite different under, under Chief Justice Zonda. I do uh, really wish though that, that whoever um, deals with the agenda of the JSC would, would um, do better timekeeping. Um, often we sit from nine in the morning until, well, I wish, two or three the next morning. Uh, because once we finish with the interviews, then we have uh, a closed meeting amongst the members. And that uh, can really take forever politicians being very, very verbose, fond of their own voices, and um, <laughs> not necessarily um, producing... Uh, input of great uh, acumen, so, so it's really uh, it's very tiring and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that the timekeeping time is going to be better. Um, I do think that it's grossly unfair to keep somebody waiting for the interview from 12 o'clock until, until 10 o'clock and, and they're just sitting waiting for the interview. I mean, if we're tired and crabby, imagine how they feel. And the interview of the person who was interviewed at 9 and the interview of the person who was interviewed at 10 at night is not the same interview. Uh, and so I, I don't think it's fair, and, and uh, Chief Justice Zonda made it very clear that he was not going to allow that type of thing. 
Um, and the last uh, interviews that he chaired uh, were much, uh, much closer to, to time periods. We still run over, but hopefully if we keep on working on it, we'll, um, we'll get better at it. And, uh, and, and hopefully we'll also get better at um, screening candidates with a higher quality and more probing questions. Uh, that are geared to uh, to evaluate the, the abilities of the candidates to be a judge, um, as opposed to finding out how far along your own personal case is getting along in that judge's court, which is what some of the candidates thought that that, uh, that the JSC was for. So I'm happy to take questions on the JSC. Um, but I, I'm not sure if you want me to discuss any other matters I'll, at the end, at the very end. Okay. Uh, Just a few words about the electoral Yeah, so the, you mentioned the headlines that perhaps you're not going to have a, a, an election at all, and somebody said wonderful. Well, it's not wonderful. Mm. Whoever said it's wonderful is not wonderful. You want to be having elections every, every five years, believe me. Uh, and you don't want that to ever change. Because if we miss one set, we're gone. Mm. Once you move that little uh, rope, you're never going to get it back. So elections we've got to have. Uh, it's very, very unlikely. It's certainly a vague possibility that they, they won't take place in time, but exceptionally unlikely. <clears throat> the Constitutional Court has made it extremely difficult, um, saying that we should have independent candidates. It's a, it's a model and a concept that doesn't really fit. I must say that um, electoral uh, amendments are not my forte, and if you really want a, an educated discussion on electoral reform, I can recommend uh, somebody better than myself to do it uh, at some point if you're interested, and I'll, I'll get him to come and do it. Uh, but it's, uh, we've been looking at, at four different models, um, different internationally and, and elsewhere, and, 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 and within our own ranks, looking at, at four different models, what would work the best. We don't find one that actually works very well at all. Um, and I know this isn't a party political uh, meeting, but uh, the reason that it doesn't work very well from our point of view is that uh, they all seem to favor the ruling party. <laughs> so, so, so for us, that's a problem, and we're still trying to look for alternatives. Um, the difficulty with independence is independence, so independent candidates, is, is, uh, is mostly, from our point of view, uh, one of accountability. Um, once you're elected, you're there for five years, you can you know, sit on a warm rock and drink beer for five years, and, and then you won't, probably won't get re-elected, but who cares, you've had five years. And there's no way of holding you to account, at least uh, in, in, in the situation which we're in now with proportional representation. Uh, if I don't perform, my party will fire me and replace me with somebody who hopefully performs better. Um, so there is accountability. There is, uh, if, I, if I don't attend uh, portfolio committee meetings, eventually somebody will notice and say, but you know, you're getting paid to know where are you? Although there are people who really don't come and doesn't appear to get noticed. Um, if I don't go and sit in the National Assembly and, and participate in debate, uh, my party will say, well, we need somebody who's a little bit more present than you are, so cheers. Uh, but if you're independent, we see it with, with the very small parties as well. We have one, maybe two representatives. They don't come. And there's no, there's no one to hold them to account. And so the people who voted for them have no voice because they're not there. And they're not, they're not preparing and they're not participating and they're not making an input and they're not uh, dealing with, with the things that Parliament deals with. They're not, um, they're not making inputs into new legislation. They're not holding um, the various departments over which they've oversight to account. And so, so you know, the people who voted for them are not getting any bang for their buck. Whereas on the proportional representation system, people are getting bang for their buck. If you don't perform, you're gone. Well, certainly in, in my party, and not in every party. Um, so that, that issue of, uh, of amending the legislation is getting a lot of attention because it's becoming more and more uh, urgent and imminent. Um, everybody's working very hard towards it. What the solution is, I can't tell you. Uh, we don't have one yet. Um, and on the best case scenario of counting votes as they currently stand, um, it looks like there will, if, if we had an election tomorrow, on, uh, on the way election trends go, there would only be one independent elected, and that would be from uh, Kwakwa in the Free State. 
Um, so there, there would be no others uh, on the current uh, sort of voting basis format. So, um, so whether it's going to be successful or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, there's nothing we can do about avoiding it. So we have to find a model that, that works. Uh, it's not going to be so easy. I think it's a, a big ask. And, and I, I don't easily criticize the uh, Constitutional Court, but I do think that they ish, perhaps um, this wasn't like the very best decision they made. <laughs> <laughs>